Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us this morning for this webinar co-hosted by the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and the Innovation Policy Lab. I'm Nala Ayed. I'm host of CBC Radio's Ideas. And the idea that we are discussing today is, will COVID-19 bring us together or blow us apart the global security implications of the pandemic? It is a big topic and we only have one hour, um, but I, a couple of housekeeping matters to get to first. Uh, just to let you know, our plan is to have a very short discussion to lay out some of the broad themes and then we'd really like to include you in the conversation. So do send in your questions and be sure to specify to whom your question is directed so that we can be efficient, as efficient as possible. Uh, you can send questions via Zoom, the Zoom app Q&A uh, tool or you can tweet at Monk School or you can email events.monk at utoronto.ca. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the panelists, I'd be surprised if any of you aren't, but uh, we'll, a quick introduction here. Our panelists today are Ron Diebert, Director of the Citizen Lab and Professor at Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. John R. Lindsay, Assistant Professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And Janice Stein, Founding Director of the Monk School and the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And I also want to just take uh, uh, this opportunity, uh, you know, speaking with you to quickly share a big ideas moment with you, if you'll indulge me. Not only do we have a former CBC Massey lecturer in this virtual room, Janice Stein, who delivered the lectures back in 2001, titled The Cult of Efficiency, but we're also proud to officially announce today that the 2020 CBC Massey lectures will be delivered by Ron Diebert. And the title of his lectures is Reset, Reset reclaiming the internet for civil society. Um, so the lectures, which as usual will be published as a book by a house of an NC press, will expose the internets and especially social media's disproportionate and increasingly toxic influence in every aspect of life. And certainly as uh, uh, we face the US, uh, the coming US election and who knows, possibly a Canadian one too, uh, and for myriad other reasons, Ron Diebert's analysis couldn't be more timely uh, or needed. So congratulations, Ron. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, hearing and reading your insights uh, this fall. Thank and one other thing, much. thank you, Ron. And, and one other thing is just so you know, today's um, discussion is being recorded and made available online afterwards, but it's also being recorded for possible broadcasts on our show, uh, CBC Radio's Ideas. So let's get started. Um, long before COVID-19, I'm stating the obvious here, there were many worrying trends on the global security front, whether it's concerns about the fraying liberal international order or the rise of nationalism or the growing inequality, there was already a lot to worry about. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that COVID, that, that all of you believe uh, that COVID-19 and the instability it has ushered in at best kind of brings those existing concerns into sharp focus, and at worst is actually exacerbating them. And I'd like to get at where this is happening and how. And so Janice, I'd like to start with you. What would you put at the top of your list of risks that have been heightened by the pandemic we're living through? Uh, COVID-19 is a dramatic accelerator. Uh, in some cases, no, but it doesn't bend uh, the arc of history. Uh, in, in any important ways. So the one that I'd like to put on the agenda right now uh, is the fraying relationship between the United States and China. Uh, that, there were already real challenges in that relationship before, but the pandemic has really exacerbated these. And for curious, we, for, for curious reasons in a sense, because both China and the United States are weakened by this pandemic but just weakened in very different ways. Uh, and we see the conflict now, it was already deepening in technology, it's deepened even further as a result of the, you know, huge jump in the way civilians are being monitored in China as a result of the pandemic and personal identification, all those sorts of things that have been used as a pandemic management set of tools, but also really deep in the monitoring uh, of individual citizens. I know Ron will have something to say about that. Uh, but in, in trade, in technology, in national security, across every dimension of the relationship, the relationship is really in trouble now. 
And I think we're, we're, at, uh, we're at an inflection point. The, and there are two ways to go here. Uh, does this become um, a rivalry in which collaboration and uh, competition are enmeshed? That's one way. Or does this really deepen into all out competition, which excludes collaboration on some very, very important global issues? Thank you, Janice, for that. Uh, John, I'm interested in a follow up from you in your thoughts specifically on what the, the specific effects of the COVID 19 crisis are that are exacerbating some of these existing problems, like, uh, as Janice mentioned, the worsening China US relationship or democratic recession or any of the other issues. What are the actual features of this pandemic that are heightening existing risks that you're particularly worried about? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, if this disease attacks pre-existing conditions, the fact that we've got uh, at least uh, five or six burning pre-existing conditions uh, that we were already suffering from is, is cause for concern. Um, you know, and it's not the disease itself, it's often the response to it that causes the problem. So, uh, you know, Janice mentioned this, this condition of emerging multipolarity. Uh, it's not just the tension between uh, the U.S. and China. It's encouraging a certain degree of, of opportunism uh, within China, both uh, abroad in the East and South China Sea, uh, elsewhere on its periphery, uh, and a, a, an ongoing assertion of kind of this new, more robust authoritarian uh, style that China has been pioneering for the last five years under Xi Jinping. Um, the loss of faith in the global liberal order, again, this is an ongoing problem. Uh, scholars differ on when they're going to date it, date it uh, but certainly the 2008 uh, financial crisis and its aftershocks uh, was an important event, and that exposed a lot of the tension between uh, North, Northern and Southern Europe, uh, for example, Western and Eastern uh, Europe. So now when we're looking at uh, the most serious financial global economic crisis since the Great Depression, uh, that is something I think that should make us you know, increasingly concerned. It's gonna double down on some of those problems. But I think what I want to, to mention um, uh, is that all of these problems, and we kind of focus on uh, the issues for the United States, Canada, its relationship with China and Europe, uh, both emerging and past uh, great powers. I think it's important to bear in mind that the security impacts of this pandemic may be borne disproportionately by the global south. So when you think about uh, ongoing challenges in climate change, in the global migration crisis, um, which again, to be clear, we're um, larger than the population of the United States is now uh, a drift throughout the world, either as an external refugee or as an internally displaced person. That's a huge number of people. Many of those are from or concentrated in the global south. When we think about Africa, just to take one example, right? Think about the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, no stranger to disease is the 10th Ebola outbreak they're now dealing with, uh, with you know, kind of 40 years of ongoing civil war. 200 coups in Africa since 1950, half of those successful, and most of those occur during periods of unrest, economic downturn, political crisis. So the military is sort of seen as the only trustworthy organ in these societies, and yet it is a very kind of authoritarian, very coercive uh, organ. So uh, that does not bode well for kind of stability and the fate of uh, liberal order, as it were, uh, in, in Africa and other places. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Ron, it's, it's per perhaps in your area of expertise where we might see a, a greater leap forward, if I can use that expression, in existing trends, and, and one that could be perhaps more directly ascribed to this health crisis. For example, you've, you've expended a lot of effort and time uh, pointing out the huge gaps in regulating tracking technology before COVID-19. How have those concerns that you've had uh, changed with the pandemic? Thank you, Nella. And yeah, I, I would say that the remarks that Janice and, and John made are very much in line with, with my feelings as well. Um, you know, I'm looking at the technological environment and there are certain features of it that um, I think are, are highly problematic um, when it comes to the context around COVID. Of course, you know, technology is pervasive. It's embedded in just about everything that we do right now. So it's not surprising that um, authorities and, and the public have looked to technology to provide a solution when it comes to things like contact tracing and so forth. But um, there are some really disturbing features of the technological environment that you mentioned that I think should give us all 
um, serious cause for concern. First of all is that um, the technological environment is um, highly insecure. Uh, in insecurity is endemic across the entire environment. And this is, you know, a byproduct of the fact that uh, innovation has been prioritized, the, the mantra of move fast and break things. Uh, we already lived in, in this uh, environment before. Uh, if you look at the very platform we're using right now, for example, Zoom, as recently as a couple of months ago, um, the encryption was, was very poorly designed. Uh, we did a report that showed how uh, even a, a moderately resourced uh, threat actor could decrypt the, the sessions um, that we're using right now. And some of the session keys were coming from servers in China. Um, so, you know, what, what happens with Zoom is, is just a, uh, a symptom of a much larger problem of the entire technological environment. The other part of it is it's really, um, there's a, it's, it's largely unregulated, or there are large portions of it that are unregulated. And you have this shady underworld of data brokers and location tracking companies, uh, most of which uh, uh, service um, uh, the advertising industry, but also bleed over into state security and intelligence services. And of course that leads to another really disturbing feature is that the whole area is prone to abuse. Um, the companies that engage in location tracking and and uh, cell phone surveillance, um, uh, that service uh, intelligence agencies and law enforcement, um, as we've shown in our research, uh, have, have led to widespread abuses. And, and of course, in the context that John's talking about, where you have this troubling descent into authoritarianism, uh, a really a, a, a global economy characterized increasingly by kind of a transnational gangster class, is the way I, I think about it, you add this all up and I think it presents a very disturbing picture because what we're seeing being normalized is a, is a type of biomedical surveillance, um, you know, tracking that's embedded in everything that we do, but without proper safeguards to prevent abuse. And in the hands of, you know, autocrats and despots, we're already seeing what some of the um, consequences will be for marginalized communities, uh, for civil society, for uh, journalists, lawyers, human rights defenders. Um, so that's what I'm most worried about when I think about what the new normal uh, is beginning to look like. There are so many threads to pull on. And so I, I'd like to kind of keep my questions as open-ended as possible. And so Ron, maybe just to follow up on, on, your, on your comments, I'd like to understand, you know, obviously a big feature of this, of this pandemic is, is obviously the, the economic collapse or depression, whatever you, you want to call it. I'm curious how that plays into the exacerbation of the risks uh, involved with technology and privacy and cybersecurity that you mentioned. What, what does that do for big tech and how that's involved in our daily lives and, and, and worsening these concerns that you're worried about? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there are a couple of aspects. One, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, many sectors of the economy took a big hit and are taking a big hit, except for the tech platforms. They've really, uh, it's been a field day for them. They've had a bonanza because of course we've all had to go into self-isolation, work from home. I think uh, as we emerge out of this, people aren't rushing back into the offices and to face-to-face meetings. They're not traveling as much as they, they were in the past. And so we're relying more on, on technology and tech platforms and applications. And the whole ecosystem that I just described is really benefiting without any, any compensating measures to prevent the abuses that we saw in the past. So it's kind of like we're entrenching this deeply flawed system in our lives. Um, the other part that I worry about is the tracking and surveillance that is already beginning to materialize as we move back to work. So, um, you know, the labor force that works in, in, in industries and office buildings and so on, um, are now being required to carry with them things like immunity passports or other applications that determine their health status um, and, and other sorts of artificial intelligence, facial recognition systems, thermal imaging systems. Um, so you're seeing you know, pervasive surveillance in the workplace, which already existed before, uh, now magnifying quite dramatically and accentuating all of the discriminatory practices that were embedded in those systems before. 
Um, so unfortunately, what I'm seeing is exacerbation of some of these um, uh, trends around class inequities. And I, I would just highlight again what John said about the global south. I agree 100%. Uh, that's really where um, I think we'll see some of the worst features magnified quite dramatically. Maybe yeah, we can... Go jump ahead, Janice, please. Jump in, Nala, um, yes, please. To, to elaborate on, on two points that Ron made, which I think are really important. Not only do we see uh, an absence of appropriate regulation in the areas that you're talking about, Ron, at home, but we're actually seeing, again, a global division on internet governance, which is uh, something that both John and Ron worry about all the time. And, and you can actually see this playing out in real time as a result of COVID, where China and others who use the co-language digital sovereignty, and it's Russia, and it's, it's far from being isolated to China, you see a big difference in the places where they are going out to develop regulation. Uh, you see this working out, we see this in, in international institutions where these splits are deepening. So not only is it, is it going to be tougher to regulate at home, I actually think it's going to be tougher to get regulation internationally. And I want to add, this is not only a private sector problem. It's a government problem. We tend to talk about private sector because these are the companies and the tools and the devices that we all have to hand. Uh, but this is a space that is equally occupied by governments who, frankly, as a result of COVID, uh, not only the despots and the authoritarians, but everybody is now freer uh, to regulate. And there's not even a kind of nod of the head now to appropriate international regimes to manage this. So that's a, and, and that's a big worry, I think, coming out of this one. But Ron and, and John, you actually co-wrote an article recently about security threats to civil society actors, you know, activists, for example, and uh, that the COVID era so far has featured a kind of a, a renewed activism, whether it's the Black Lives Matter protests or, or what's happening in Hong Kong. And I, I wondered if we could just quickly address the security implications of COVID-19 in those kinds of scenarios. John, maybe if you could John, tackle John. that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, you know, it, as Ron was talking about the kind of security weaknesses of kind of going back to work, um, that in the sense is something that is in the comfort zone for a lot of these big tech firms because they're like, we're a big tech firm, we support other big firms, this is our business, that's a new cybersecurity threat, that's what we do, right? So we can now continue to sell our stuff, cybersecurity has become big business, and so they will continue to do that, right? Um, but what has been missed before is continued to be missed now, which is the real threats are on civil society actors that not only don't have the resources to buy these these uh, expensive protections, they're also um, uh, differentially targeted by powerful actors. So now that we have, uh, you know, more people in the streets in the United States and other places, uh, now that we've got, um, you know, unfortunately, maybe Hong Kong entering its end game, right? Uh, these tools uh, are available, have been available, and, um, you know, it's just there are now more targets and more opportunities. So it's, it's, a, it's an alarming situation. You watch the helicopters flying over those demonstrations um, that we saw Black Lives Matter. That's, again, the government playing a role here, too, and having access to all this kind of technology with, with really no restriction. Janice, going back to the issue you raised at the beginning, which is perhaps one of the, because it's, it has such a large global implications, it's maybe one of the biggest overarching issues, which is the relationship between the US and China and also the, the threats to the liberal international order. And I wonder if you could um, just, just speak briefly, and in fact, we're starting to get some questions and, and they seem to center around, you know, actually, I'll, I'll just read one of them, you know, what is the, it's a really big question. What's the path towards a best possible resolution of US-China tensions? And is there a role for Canada uh, in, in trying to mitigate the risks that already existed, as you say, but have made, been made worse by the competition that's uh, brought forward by, the, uh, by this pandemic? You know, that's a great question, uh, Nala. And I, I'm one of those who believes that public policy choices and leaders' choices really make a difference. There is nothing determined uh, here about the way we move forward coming out of the COVID uh, 
pandemic and we will. So a, a big part of this is the way leaders in both countries, because the responsibility is shared. It's not on one side here, it's shared. Uh, whether they understand that it is possible to compete and collaborate at the same time, it's as simple as that. There are a whole set of big global problems that neither one of those two can solve on their own. Just take climate change uh, is the obvious one. Governance of the internet, that's a second big one, which is gonna really be important over these next few years. Health, governance of health, uh, how we share resources. If, you know, if we're worrying about marginalized people, as I think all three of us are, who gets access to therapeutics and vaccines over the next year or two or three? That has to be a global conversation. If China and the United States can all recognize that they have shared interests, um, in talking and solving and managing those problems, we're in really big trouble. They have to have, you have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> and if you can't recognize it, you have to collaborate as the same time as you can be in an all out competition for who's gonna have the best national champion in, you know, in an area of robotics or AI. Uh, you need to be able to do both of those. There are deep constituencies in both countries who want all uh, competition here and are busy demonizing the other right now. We've been there before in history. That is not a good place to be. And that's gonna get worked out over the next few years. We are on a trajectory when, you know, I, I, I compare it in a way um, to the 45, 48 period, 1945, 48 period, that I frankly think the liberal international order is, I would go a little further than John here, he was too polite, it's on its last legs, frankly. Yeah. Uh, it just is, it's very hard for Canadians to say that because it was so good to us and we flourished during it. Um, and we are, so we know what's going, we don't yet know where we're going to. Uh, and those decisions, these decisions over these next few years are absolutely critical. We need to get them right. And there is a role for Canada. Canada's sandwiched. It lives next door to the United States. We will always live next door to the United States. We can't move. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, and they are huge, they have huge impact on our economy, on our security, on our society, on our health, on, on everything. But we have long lived by reaching out and trying to find ways to collaborate even as we compete. And I think that's a big challenge. John, do you want to address that a little bit? Especially sort of if we look at the medium term, if we're looking possibly, if we're being optimistic at an end at some point, but you know, let's say 12 to 24 months of, of COVID and suddenly we have a pandemic or we have a, a vaccine. I mean, is it realistic to expect that some of these exacerbating uh, influences would suddenly disappear? Um, or are we looking at, you know, these challenges, this accelerating challenges continuing despite an end, let's say, to the pandemic? Well, because they existed before, they're probably going to continue afterwards. Um, you know, while this is exacerbating, um, you know, the question is whether it's going to snap back or not, right? Um, if you had a new administration in the White House, would everything reset? I don't think so, right? Uh, the problems are much, much deeper. Um, when you look at, uh, you know, OECD, uh, um, uh, uh, countries, right, their populations have been increasingly punishing centrist parties that advocate for liberal internationalist cooperation and institutional solutions, uh, and increasingly rewarding uh, more fringe parties, right? So there's kind of this deep dissatisfaction in civil society, right, with the liberal international order, which ostensibly says that it's been speaking for them, right? But there is a feeling that it hasn't been delivering. Now, you know, right or wrong, right, that's kind of the reality. And so now we've gone through this natural social science experiment where we've seen the ostensible liberal hegemon, the United States, utterly fail to do the right thing. I mean, it couldn't handle this crisis uh, more incompetently if it tried. Um, and so if the liberal international order is based around US leadership, and yet in this one case where American interests should have been completely engaged, 
it still can't get it together and deliver, um, I think, you know, people are right to ask, um, is there something else? Is this really all it's cracked up to be? So uh, there aren't forthcoming answers. Maybe there are factions that are trying to uh, provide answers, and we really might not like some of those answers that are being provided. Um, but I think that's the underlying dynamic that this has not only exacerbated, but will tend to lock in. Um, I have a question here for Ron from the audience. Um, are international institutions robust enough to support the development of those safeguard safeguards we need to protect privacy, freedom, and creativity? Uh, sort of as a follow-up, where do we begin to implement them? Uh, that's a really good question. I was actually just going to um, uh, focus my remarks on, on that very point. I think if you listen to what my colleagues Janice and John just described, it's a pretty bleak picture, but it's very accurate. I mean, we have the term perfect storm is overused, but I really do feel we have a perfect storm of variables right now. Um, you look at emergency laws, suspensions of civil liberties uh, in the context of already uh, deeply pervasive corruption uh, across all sectors of the economy um, and uh, a turn to security forces to help deal with the pandemic. You know, if you look globally, police, intelligence, military, are leading the COVID response in a lot of countries. Um, also the decline of US hegemony. I mean, international institutions and global governance right now is really like a dumpster fire. Um, so you have a recipe for terrific abuse of power. And especially, um, uh, I think um, this is going to really uh, hit hard on global civil society. So what do we do? Where do we begin? I think it's very hard to think about governing the globe as a whole. So we have to think about uh, using that old um, uh, environment, environment adage about uh, thinking globally, but acting locally, uh, starting at the most basic local levels, but network together internationally. So, you know, a good place to begin is within our municipalities, uh, ensuring that as we come out of this crisis through these various phases, uh, we make sure there are proper safeguards to prevent the abuse of power among our local police forces. And if we do that in whatever municipality in which we live, uh, share best practices with each other, it's the only way that we can start recovering uh, a semblance of the liberal democratic order and then work outwards. Um, I think right now it's, it's very difficult to think about reining it all in internationally. Um, already, prior to all of this, I was exhausted by what I was uh, seeing when it comes to cybersecurity governance. Hypocrisy was pervasive. You'd have these, you know, well-intentioned bureaucrats from foreign affairs ministries getting together and talking about rules of the road for cyberspace and how we should all behave ideally. Meanwhile, back home, all of their governments were routinely violating all of the well-intentioned principles they were putting down on paper. Um, so I, I really do think that we need to start locally and begin within our own uh, municipalities and start connecting to each other, recovering a sense of, of dignity, ethics, and safeguards against the abuse of power. Here's also a bit of an optimistic story just to pull up on Ron, because we're all so gloomy. I think we're going to drive everybody over the edge in this conversation. We're losing participants. That's right. So, so here's a really good story that speaks to your point of where, where do you look for governance in today's world? You actually look for it in network groups. So something was started in the 50s it's called the Flu Network. And it was just a bunch of folks, like the three of us, <laughs> virologists and epidemiologists, who started to share data, right? Well, that network has grown. It started as a network just of experts. It then worked with the WHO, the WHO, the much maligned WHO, linked together 160 national labs, who then selected what flu strains would get put in the vaccine every year, developed procedures for vaccine management. And so out of this network civil society organization came really the infrastructure for governance at a crucial moment. And a good part of this story, and that's why we have to tell a good news story here, is that the labs that were linked together, they were the critical labs when COVID broke. They are the leading labs in each of these countries. And when China posted the sequence of the virus online, it used a website that was created by this network. 
So just to underline Ron's story here, here's an immediately practical and relevant story of how the stuff can work from the bottom up, not only from the top down. But just a simple question to both of you. I mean, at a time like this, when, as you say, borders are closed and governments are looking inward and are busy with, their, uh, with the pandemic, is the capacity there to have those kinds of conversations at all at this stage? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think John and Ron will say the same thing, that we, we leap across borders to work with colleagues, to talk to colleagues. We try to find the most secure ways to do it, but we do it. And in a funny way, and here's, a, here's another you know, good news story, relatively speaking, because we're all stuck at home, we reach out across the world to bring people into these conversations far more than we were doing before this started. It's easier to do than it was. So you just send Ron an email and say, I hop on Zoom, and he usually agrees, depending on his humor. Um, and so we are actually getting a lot of good stuff going that I hope survive, you know, carries on after the epidemic is over. So it's, I, I don't want people to get discouraged by looking only at our formal institutions. Those formal institutions were purpose built for a world that's gone. If I, so if I could jump in, I'm, I, please go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I, I, would, I just I appreciate what Janice is saying, but I'm not sure I'm that optimistic about new habits that we're entering into given the insecurity of the digital environment that we're relying on and the pervasive insecurity that characterizes it i think we're all basically now sitting ducks and it's a it's a perfect environment if you look at it from the position of an autocrat or a kleptocrat somebody who's into abusing power uh it's it's a perfect situation to have people isolated in their homes, unable to get out in the street without great personal risk, relying on these platforms, which were uh, designed uh, from the get-go to be almost insecure by design is the way that I think about it, because they're basically uh, oriented around monitoring all of us right down to the biological level. And so this is a, a perfect situation for someone who wants to neutralize any sort of legitimate opposition. So I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the habits that we're now falling into as much as I like answering Janice's email and getting together. I appreciate the comment. I do think we need to, to really understand the risks that we face because the only way out of this is by working locally but networking together, as Janice says. But we also have to appreciate that we're relying on technologies that weren't built with security in mind, weren't built for active organizing. Um, you know, we need to address uh, the elephant in the room, which is the business model at the heart of all of the technology that we're relying on, surveillance capitalism. We have to somehow mitigate some of the excesses of that business model, rein it in. We don't have to invent something new here. We have regulatory tools at our disposal that we can employ uh, because I really think the business model is at the heart of a lot of the problems that we're seeing, insecurity, toxic public sphere all of that's related to the dynamics of the social media platforms upon which we rely so i want to get to a couple more audience questions uh and and the, here's one for janice that's back to the uh, the concerns about inter the international order janice says that the rules-based international order is on its last legs what evidence is there that it still exists uh, they, they go on to say that neither superpower appears to act with any regard for norms or institutions and that unconstrained behavior appears to be spreading it might be wiser for us to acknowledge that it is already gone and act accordingly what do you think of that janice and i'll go to john with the same question as well uh, you know i think there's a lot of wisdom in that question frankly um but again i, I am trying to be as optimistic as i can uh, given my two colleagues here um, <laughs> who are pushing up in the other direction. So the, I, you're, the question is quite right, that we're the, we have now the three most powerful, you know, the United States and China clearly have no interest or commitment to anything that by the wildest stretch of imagination. Right now, the United States uh, could be called the liberal international order. And Russia um, is hardly uh, an actor that we want to celebrate. Mm. But we have strong pockets still. Uh, the European Union is, uh, is a rules-based order that seeks to export and is actually playing an interesting role in the issue Ron just talked about, which is privacy regulation. 
it, it can't compete, but it is a sort, it is exporting rules and norms. You know, we played a really interesting role. We don't talk enough about this in Canada, but Trump has weaponized the, the World Trade Organization. He refused to appoint judges to their appeal, what we call the output body. There's one judge left and you can't hear any disputes right now. Literally paralyzed it. Uh, what did we do in Canada? We convened a group of countries who said, let's do a workaround. And they actually did. They put in place a way where countries who are involved in trade disputes can voluntarily agree uh, to abide uh, by a set of provisions. 37 countries have signed on to that. And what unites those 37 countries is an interest in rules-based system. Um, so I, I think it's premature to give up hope entirely. And what I think we can see with luck and depending on the, the courage um, of, of our leaders and how smart and strategic they are, what we can really see is what I would call coalitions of like-minded liberals <laughs> who are interested in rules, who come together. As Ron said, we're, we can no longer think this is the model way forward for the whole globe, but we certainly can see um, coming together over specific issues that matter and creating um, areas <laughs> where liberal rules will still continue to matter. John, can you address this as well? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, oh, so, sorry, John. Jo John, and then Ron. <laughs> so, so at least be more pessimistic. Uh, I like to think realistic, but um, so, so yeah, let, I want to kind of pull this out a little bit more. And if, you know, the liberal order is already kaput and something else is emerging and we call it great power competition, uh, what does that really look like? So we mentioned Russia. Russia is a declining kleptocracy, but they have thousands of nuclear weapons. So lots of potential to cause problems. But let's think about the US-China relationship. Emerging great power competition means that military tensions are going to be a rising and unavoidable part of this relationship. Now, what COVID has exposed is are certain vulnerabilities, right? Uh, the United States, because it has been on this kind of imperial policing mission for the last uh, 30 years, has forces that are very small and very dependent on information technology because we can go out to places where the, where the United States is, is not directly opposed. Um, when we think about a confrontation with China, that's a very different ballgame. Now, COVID has revealed that there are some serious military readiness problems that exist in the United States military and other places, right? Uh, one of uh, four deployed aircraft carriers was taken offline by COVID. In the UK, uh, Boris Johnson, right, was on a ventilator for three days. They have one deployed uh, 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 ballistic missile submarine, right? What happens if COVID hits that, right? So, so it kind of exposes the really, really thin military infrastructure that has been underwriting this liberal order, which is really not up to the task of perhaps carrying on this next uh, phase of competition. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be looking at a huge buildup. In fact, you know, we should be deeply concerned about uh, the potential for arms racing that's going to emerge out of this. But it does mean that we're going to have to start to think smartly about where these new military tensions are going to ri uh, arise when we have a thin and vulnerable uh, 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 set of forces to deal with. Vulnerable not just in terms of their vulnerability to biosecurity and pandemic type things, but vulnerable to all of the same cybersecurity stories uh, that we've just been talking about intensively with civil society also creates temptations for uh, perhaps opportunist, opportunism in the military sphere. Um, and when you have very, very thin forces, right, the incentives for opportunism perhaps increase. So that's something I think that I'm very, very uh, concerned about. And it means that we're not just gonna be able to wish it away by hoping that we can just return to this enormous base order, because as Ron pointed out, and as Janice alluded to, it might not have been doing that work to begin with. We're going to have to really start making uh, 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 really, really clear-eyed calculations about what we want to care about and what we want to let go. Ron, do you want to add something there? Sure, yeah, I could say a couple of things. I, I think one is we need to be careful not to mythologize either U.S. hegemony of the past or the liberal international order. I think we could all uh, recite uh, so many horrifying examples of of abuses of, a, of power and other problems uh, 
uh, decades ago. So it's not like we had a perfect system in the past that we're losing. Um, I think it's, to me, it's kind of refreshing to think about the existing rule-based international order as one that principally serves a transnational uh, class of gangsters. Once you think about it that way, uh, it puts it in a slightly different perspective. And I think um, it also gives us some grounds for optimism because even though we're looking at a deterioration of norms internationally and um, you know, governments not, not following liberal principles, uh, they do all have a stake in maintaining the existing international system. Even North Korea, uh, which is you know, the most closed off autar autarkic country in the world, depends on telecommunications and the internet for its illicit economy. So they all have a stake in kind of keeping it hanging together. Uh, which gives us some, um, you know, grounds for modifying this system. But we can't do it until we have our own house in order. And I think that's why I really, really believe that we need to start locally and making sure we have proper systems of transparency and accountability that for the governments that serve us most directly. And once we have those in place, then we work to instill them internationally. Um, here's a question that is uh, that ends with the line trying to find some optimism just following on, on Janice's uh, point there this pandemic seems to have been a boon to authoritarian leaders they are unable to control what unforeseen uh, results it could cause might such unpredictable results ironically also cause the downfall of such leaders John is that something you could tackle um. Sure. Well, I mean, we're kind of just speculating at this point, right? I mean, there's lots of, lots of reasons why you know governments stay in power and, and don't stay in power. Um, but you know, I mean, unrest is something that that authoritarian regimes have always been deeply concerned about, right? Because um, they're usually going to be the first to go uh, if there is a revolution or something else, right? So you know, peaceful power transitions aren't kind of what they used to be or what what they are in democracies. So um, you know that simultaneously creates more incentive to double down on what you're already doing and perhaps uh, creates you know, more resistance to it. So um, I think that's definitely a potential and that would just kind of inject even more chaos into this already turbulent system. Okay, that's a well, quick word. Yeah, in my relentlessly optimistic mode here, because really, I'm, what are you two doing with your spare time, <laughs> is all I can say. Um, you know, one of the problems when you have a pandemic like this, Nala, is authoritarian governments are really terrible in the early stages. And the reason they're so bad in the early stages, they don't get information because people are afraid to communicate that information up. That's really the story in China. There were certainly people who knew about this, but they were terrified of their own immediate supervisors and the information got locked uh, as it went up the chain. So yes, once it became apparent, the Chinese imposed draconian measures that democracies are really struggling with, frankly. And so they look more efficient, but they are efficient in an information poor environment. And if I think about the 21st century, the one thing I'm reasonably confident about, it will not favor those who live in information poor environments. Here's a question that directly addresses our topic, you know, on the head. Once we get a vaccine, how can we ensure that it will be distributed fairly throughout the world and not hoarded by a few powerful countries holding the rest of the world hostage? We actually have some regulations, by the way, just to get this one off, right? Uh, and that's, again, we're not living in a, an environment that is full of gangsters who don't have to follow any rules. And anybody who's ever studied gangsters know gangsters follow rules and have norms. We just don't like them, but they're rule followers. Uh, so exactly. It, Okay, so there is there something called IHR, International Health Regulations, which um, over this last decade, as we've gone through pandemic after pandemic, actually set up mechanisms for mandating a fairer and more equitable justification, you know, distribution of vaccines. Now that's going to come crashing up against. Uh, what John described earlier as a realistic expectation here that we are in a legitimacy race for who develops the vaccine. And that's a China, it's really going to happen in China or the United States, frankly. We in Canada have a partnership with China, the National Research Council, um, and there will be tremendous national pressure 
to look after your own first and to, to ignore those. Who's intervening here in part in advanced planning? Um, you know, the Gates Foundation and others are trying now to put in place manufacturing and regulations in anticipation of this rush to look after yourself um, and ignore others. Um, how well they'll fare, this is really, um, it, it is just a vivid portrait of uh, where international regulation sits, where national imperatives are. You know, it'd be really interesting in all of you, hold our viewers here. Uh, we have a partnership uh, with the NRC, which is long partnered with this Chinese lab. Let's say it's ahead. It's now in its third phase clinical trial. This one early entrance. Would we expect to get that vaccine ahead of countries in Africa that China works with? I bet. I don't want to prejudge the answers that our viewers will give us here. Um, John, did you want to jump in on that one? No, I think I'll, I'll let it go. Okay. I, mean, I think all, all right. the nature's will get the, the vaccine and the question. Oh. Well, here's one specifically for you. Um, what are COVID-19 implications for the U.S. Navy and deterrence in general, particularly as ships are at risk of becoming hotspots for the virus, as we saw with the USS uh, Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, well, I mean, the U.S. Navy is having a lot of problems right now. I mean, in just endemic problems of corruption, uh, basic seamanship skills um, are in question after a couple of collisions. Um, you know, this uh, uh, the ship that I mentioned, the USS uh, uh, Perry Truman, um, you know, grounded because of COVID, but it turns out that its commander was probably not as competent as we thought he was at the beginning. So, you know, this is sort of reflective of some, you know, larger problems within the Navy. And I think it's it's in part because the United States has been able to take for granted uh, command of the seas for, you know, the past, well, since the end of the Cold War, if not, you know, well before. So uh, now that we have China in its bid to become, uh, you know, a major great power, uh, is not just building a navy, but building a global blue water navy, uh, the United States is facing a challenge that it just, uh, you know, hasn't seen uh, for anybody that's currently serving in, in the military right now at an operational level. So um, it's not just about having to kind of buy more ships or do more things. There's kind of certain kind of cultures of, you know, of, maritime strategy that are that really need to be uh, rebuilt and uh, that's gonna it's gonna matter for Canada as well right I mean we're on the same continent surrounded by the same uh, two big oceans so uh, you know I think we have an interest in building that I mean navies have uh, traditionally been part of the infrastructure that enables uh, liberalism either with a big L or a little one um, so to the degree that we want to maintain even thinner, more specialized versions of these orders, right? Uh, navies that can uh, enable transit on kind of the great open oceanic common are, are really important. Um, a lot of questions are coming back to the US-China relationship, unsurprisingly. So uh, here's another one where uh, someone is agreeing with Janice's good news story, but they're saying that the current US administration seems very keen to expand China's isolation on a very comprehensive basis. And so uh, they're saying that what is what realistically are the top priorities for positive engagement with China in 2021, Janice? You know, I, I would just I would just say the question of the United States has an incoherent strategy towards China, which reflects its incoherent and shambolic present, frankly. Right? If we had more time, I could tell you stories. Um, that just would, would astonish our, our viewers. But I think the areas for collaboration are so clear. Overwhelmingly, it's climate change. Uh, that, is a, that is an issue with China. Is, is China's leadership really understands the magnitude of the threat and also gets that it needs to work internationally um, through international institutions to move forward. Um, this particular president doesn't, but I really do believe that a change in administration would make a difference here. And it would, in a very concrete, practical way, be possible for the United States and China to come back to the international table to try to move that issue forward. There's no question pandemic management. This is a wake-up call for people. Uh, it is, and, and, you know, let me just say this. This is not the big one fortunately, because we were so unprepared for it. But it is not the big one. The, as awful as this, as this has been, and as many people have died, the lethality of COVID-19 
um, uh, in the way epidemiologists think about this is low. It could have been far worse. And so as we move forward, um, disease travels. It travels on an airplane. <laughs> Uh, frankly, it's not a national problem, it's a global problem. I can't imagine that there are not, that again, uh, that there will not be a capacity to work together between the United States and China on pandemic management. So there are two very concrete areas now that I expect um, will move forward globally. Ron? Yeah, I, I agree with Janice, both with respect to climate and also the change of the administration. If, if there is a silver lining about what we're witnessing unfold in the United States, it's that it, it really does look now for the first time like tr Trump's chances of re-election are, are narrowing very quickly. Um, of course, he could still win re-election, but it's looking, looking like he won't as of now. And if things continue in the traje trajectory they are, we'll probably have a new administration. I don't think it's necessarily a panacea for all that we're talking about, but anything is better uh, than that administration, I would say. Um, it would be uh, hard to do much worse. When it comes to China, I think it is a, it's really difficult, especially for a country like Canada, um, because you obviously don't want to isolate them. You want to engage them on issues like climate change, where we have shared interests, but we also um, are witnessing some pretty horrible things going on there. If you look at what's happening in Xinjiang, for example, basically this is a genocide unfolding. And we can't just uh, stand back and let something like that happen. So we have to be principled while engaging. And that's, that's the difficult balance to strike, especially for a small country like Canada. Uh, we're, you know, the whole episode that we saw with the Michaels uh, being uh, abducted in China, and the trial of the Huawei executive were caught between the US and China and principles and pragmatism. No easy solutions around any of the, that's for sure. But everybody's <laughs> gonna have to manage that one. I mean, yeah. everybody but the United States and China is gonna have to manage that one. Yeah. And what you hear when you talk to leaders around the world is nobody wants to be forced to choose. Mm -hmm. Related to all of this, somebody's asking, can the transition to the possible new international order happen without U.S. engagement? John? That's a John question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's a great question and in many ways kind of the question, right? What, what does it mean when you have to uh, have a state which has a tremendous amount of material power and will have influence um, and yet is unwilling or unable to, uh, to lead in the way that we're used to recognizing? Um, I think it's going to really amplify that tension between principles and pragmatism that Ron uh, pointed out. But maybe it also points to the way forward. I think it's kind of transition to thinking about what can be done, right? Um, pragmatism means a great deal of modesty on what we're actually going to be able to accomplish, right? So we've kind of got used, and I would say this wasn't just kind of the last 20 years of the liberal order. This is, you know, going way back to the Cold War, seeing the world in these kind of grand Manichaean terms, right? Either you're on the side of history or you're against it. Either you're part of the like-minded nations, as we talk about today, or you're this authoritarian uh, challenger. That is really not very helpful, right? With all of these different countries, there are going to be interests that we share and things that we need to work on, and there is going to be some real differences. And those differences will not be papered over, right? They're going to be sources of genuine friction. And so we're going to need the kind of deft statecraft that figures out how to work with actors in some areas, work in others, link things that we really care about, and de-link things that we don't, right? So modesty and pragmatism are going to have to be the watchwords going forward, not coming up with a solution that everybody's going to agree with and it's going to make us feel good, right? What we're trying to do and what, you know, international security is often about is avoid some of these terrible outcomes that we've just laid on the table. That's different than getting to good, right? And given that we're really looking at some dangerous straights ahead, I think we really, really do need to focus on mitigating those dangers rather than getting distracted by wanting to have all of our principles completely in a row and, 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 and get everything uh, aligned. 
you've all done a good job of, of turning the discussion where we should go, which is towards solutions. Uh, so we'll just like to spend the last few minutes discussing a, a few more, of course, recognizing that there isn't one answer, obviously, or one remedy to, to all these myriad issues. But following up on that point, John, there is a question from the audience that's related to how to navigate our way out of the, all of this is how will countries, given the, the growing inequality and the, the security implications, obviously, of unrest and instability, how will countries in the global north be able to help the global south navigate this very difficult time, which will extend well beyond the actual pandemic? Uh, stop making it worse, right? So uh, there's been kind of a rash of interventions that have been half-hearted, destabilizing, disruptive. Um, that is generating, you know, a lot of kind of the ideological, religious, environmental, you know, migratory unrest that we're seeing, uh, simply doing less of that would be good. So less military engagement, maybe more economic and diplomatic engagement would be a great start to mitigating some of those pre-existing conditions, let alone, you know, all of the coronavirus downstream effects. And Ron, when you look specifically, I guess to, to pick one of the areas you raised, but, uh, you know, the, the risks of tracking, especially as they're exacerbated in this current time, it's become, it's becoming, it has become the new normal. How do you mitigate those risks? What advice might you have, not just for governments, but also for individuals on trying to mitigate those risks as they, as they heighten? Well, I think it's a good opportunity to reflect on some of the existing problems that characterize the technological environment that predate COVID, but now are being amplified or, or at least are more in our face because of it. And I think you know, as I said before, uh, starting with social media and the business model upon which it rests, I think there, there are some obvious painful truths, as I characterize them, uh, that characterize this area. And it's not like we have to invent something new here. We have a, a toolkit to deal with some of the problems. For example, if you look at these enormous tech platforms, these are Amazon, which started out as a book reseller online and selling DVDs, is now like a global empire. Um, we should be exercising some of our antitrust tools when it comes to some of these large platforms. Um, we, we don't want to go too far in the direction of over-regulating them and opening them up to um, even worse problems than what defines them now. Uh, but we, the time has come, frankly, when uh, we have to reckon with the fact that we, we're living in a technological environment that's dysfunctional to some of the larger aims and challenges that we have, especially when it comes to solving things like the climate crisis. And so that's where I think we need to focus is to start identifying what the problems are, looking at the solutions and working on them beginning in our backyards. And Janice, just in the last minute or so, or a couple of minutes, if we look back at history, is there kind of an overarching lesson from previous crises or, or pandemics that could help us help the world navigate some of these growing tensions on the, on the global uh, scale at, at this sort of really unusual time? You know, it's interesting, Nella, because this is the least severe pandemic we've had. <laughs> Um, Spanish but, would, but would you agree the stakes are higher in this one than in previous ones? No. No, the Spanish flu killed more people than World War One did. But when historians write about that people, they don't they don't pay any attention to the Spanish flu, which is just astounding to me, frankly. So when I look out over oh, this next, so I, I'm really against hyping this pandemic. That's what I'm really trying to say to everybody, right? I think we're intolerant of it because we have been so fortunate. None of us really have had to live through a major war or a major depression or a major pandemic. And so our expectations that we can control our environment are out of whack, frankly. And that's what we're doing now is adjusting our expectations. But that's a bigger discussion. How do we help the South through this over these next few years? I think there's some very practical things um, that we can do. One, um, trade has changed over this last decade, and we are seeing much more regional trade, and we're seeing more protectionism. That is a killer for the global south, frankly. So if we're really concerned about the economic deterioration in the south, we need to do things like debt relief and pay much more attention to the protectionist measures that we are imposing against stuff that comes from the South. That's an obvious one. Make sure there's fairer and more equitable distribution of the vaccine when it comes. 
because if the North gets, you know, first order access to that and is a year or two ahead of South Africa, whose hospitals are cratering now, uh, or Pakistan from the vaccine, we are building in permanent resentment for the future. And I think they're so it's a very pragmatic things which are going to be really hard to explain to our own publics and really difficult to build support for because we're really entitled. On that note, thank you very much, Janice. Uh, that's all the time we have today, I'm afraid. Um, many, many thanks to our panelists, Professor Ron Deber, John R. Lindsay, and Janice Stein for all your insights. And thanks to everybody for participating and for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one of them. If you want to watch this again, it will be on the Monk uh, School YouTube channel. Uh, and if you want more information about uh, upcoming events, that's where you go. And also to the uh, Monk School newsletter. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much. I'm Nala Ayad, host of CBC Radio Ideas, and it's been an absolute pleasure being with you. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Nala. Great having you, Nala. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.